All right, the next one is going to be different and is going to be harder. So we should see, and this is the one that she did, talked about the ex, uh, experiment of in your book. So let's talk about oxygen. So let's try to use our book to get the right picture for oxygen. So again, we'll be doing diatomic O2 gas. Let's see, try to figure out what the diagram would look like for oxygen. Yeah, this is just the kind of thing you just uh, you just have to go through all the examples slowly to see what's going on. You can't just kind of uh, skim over it. All right. Well, it looks like you figured out most of this. Uh, figured out most of this on your own, so that's good. How many electrons is each oxygen contributing? Eight. Eight. Um, six valence electrons, but we're still counting all the electrons. That would be eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good. So now we finally have to start doubling up some of the 2p electrons. Now, we could not anymore use our old pattern. So I still have on the board the old pattern of molecular orbitals. But when you looked at the table in the book, you saw that this was changed, right? Or didn't you? Or did you? Oh, maybe no, not. I, I thought that you got that right, but maybe you didn't. Oh, you didn't change that. Okay. Now, there's actually only two orbitals that we need to change. Which are the two orbitals here that are wrong? The, um, pi 2p. Well, the sigma and the... Wait, are there two? Pi? Two pi 2p? Yeah, but one's the anti. I guess that maybe there's three yeah. orbitals that we need to change yeah. in a sense. Yeah, because now it's two... Pi 2p, then pi 2p star, then sigma 2p star. Okay. There's no sigma. Oh, no, no. There is sigma 2p. But oh, do you have to switch them? The sigma. Which two levels do I need to switch? The sigma 2 pi, 2p and then the pi 2p. Right. I think the only levels that are, I have to flip are these, right? Everything else on the board is already correct. If you look at the book. Everything else on the board. So yeah. what I have on the board is still the levels from the previous right. atoms. Um, but there's only two that we're going to have to change. Everything is right except for these two. Right. And these just have to be flipped. Right. So you might want to put stars or um, highlight in your, in your textbook that these are the only two levels that are different in those different pictures. Only the sigma 2p and the star 2p. For boron, carbon, and nitrogen, pi 2p is below sigma 2p. But for oxygen and fluorine, sigma 2p is below pi 2p. Okay. So I'm simply going to exchange these two. My bad. I 
I just flip to those two levels. This actually, I think, is more intuitive or, or makes more sense because this is now symmetrical with the antibonding orbitals. Um, but we're not going to explain why it's this way for oxygen and not this way for carbon. We're just looking it up in the book. So again, these are the two levels that you need to highlight. These are the two levels that are different for different diatomic uh, atoms. So do you guys agree that this would be the right picture? Yes. Okay, so now we need to place the electrons. pattern in the book. Or does the book actually draw that? Oh, I can see one thing. Uh, no, the book gets that right. So if you look in the book, you can see that at the, at the uh, pi 2p, for pi 2p, they draw two dashes. And for sigma 2p, they only draw one dash. So they're reminding us that there's one dash here and two dashes here. We're never going to have three dashes on the same level, as long as you're just working with s and p orbits. Good. <laughs> How many electrons are we placing in total? 16. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, 13, and 14, 15, and where does the 16th go? Not here, but here according to our Hunt's rule, the bus rule. Okay, so this is the correct picture. Notice that it's futile to start putting in the electrons until you have the dashes in the right place. First we put in the dashes, only then do we put in the electrons. And notice this orbital still exists, even though it's empty. We still should draw it, even though there's nothing in it. Uh, okay, so now we can figure out the bond order. How many electrons are in the bonding orbitals? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. And how many in the anti-bonding orbitals? One, two, three, four, five, and six. The fact that these are unpaired doesn't make any difference. It's still six. So that's one half of four, which is two. And if you actually drew the Lewis structure for oxygen, it does have two bonds. So those two parts of the theory are matching, are matching up. Paramagnetic or diamagnetic? because we have unpaired electrons. This would be paramagnetic. So should it be attracted or repelled by a magnetic field? Right. Now, let's see what the Lewis structure would uh, say for this. The Lewis structure... This is what we would draw as the Lewis structure, right? Okay, now this would be the Lewis structure for oxygen. Right? So what does the Lewis model predict? Does the Lewis model predict that this is paramagnetic magnetic or diamagnetic? Uh, well, paramagnetic. well, no, diamagnetic. We have a contradiction then between the two models, right? This model is predicting unpaired electrons. But if you actually drew the Lewis structure for oxygen by counting the valence electrons, you would not find any unpaired electrons. So what we should do is do an experiment and see, is the oxygen attracted or repelled by a magnetic field? It, it sounds like maybe your instructor actually did that experiment yeah, in class. Yeah, I a video, and there's actually oh. um, a video, I think it was just of this. Right. Oh, not the liquid oxygen was being poured, it stuck to the iron. Oh, 
and see. When liquid oxygen is poured into the space between the poles of the magnet, it remains there until it boils away, which means that it's being attracted by the magnet. Is that what we would expect for para or diamagnet? Para. So which model is supported here? The molecular. The molecular theory. All right, not the Lewis structure theory. All right, so you might wonder, why are we going to all this bother and doing all this work to do this molecular theory? If it just always gave the same predictions as the Lewis structure, we, we wouldn't need this complicated theory. The reason we need this complicated theory is sometimes the experimental evidence does not match the simple Lewis structure theory. Lewis structure theory would predict that this should not be attracted by the magnet, but when they actually, she actually showed you the video of the example that showed that the liquid oxygen was attracted by the magnet. All right, so this is another victory for the molecular theory. Although we've seen, this isn't perfect either. This has some cases where it doesn't give the exact right prediction as well. No theory is perfect. You just have to learn when the, which, what situations each theory works best in. Okay, but chemists like this theory because it lets them explain a bunch of things that they couldn't explain in some of the other theories. Here we, we're seeing how we can explain the unpaired electrons.